Okay. Aloha kako. Welcome again, everyone. Uh, to begin our meeting this evening, I'd like to welcome up Patrick Herney to open with a pule. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Let us pray. Loving Creator, we come before you this evening as a community with grateful hearts. We're grateful for the breath of life you give us this day. For all the blessings you bestowed upon us and our families, and for this beautiful place we live in Waimea. We ask you to grace this meeting tonight. Help us to open our ears, our hearts, and minds, and know that it takes all of us to come together to build your kingdom in our community. We ask this with humble hearts. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, my name is James Eustace, and I'm the president of the Waimea Community Association. Thank you all for joining us this evening as we continue in our hybrid format. Uh, we're here at Tutu's house. And a little bit of uh, video camera here. Let's see if we can work on this a little bit. Uh, we also have a couple of our guests joining us virtually online tonight. And then let's see. Nancy, if you could just uh, grab Sean when you the chair. Oh, I'm having a little bit of, uh, it's kind of weak out a little bit. If you want, but, um, these are um, addresses of public phone numbers. Oh, okay. thank you, James. You can just put them on the, on the table up there. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I wonder if I unplug it. Let me plug. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, we have a little technical difficulties. We're working on something here. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. I think we're good there. All right. Apologies for that. Just a little bit of tech stuff we'll always work through here. Um, all right. Thank you. Apologize for that. Thanks again for joining us here in person or online tonight. And we're kind of still having a little bit. Um, yeah. We'll just try and keep talking us a little bit here. All right. Well, I encourage you to follow, like, and subscribe to the Waimea Community Association on our social accounts. Uh, you can also find relevant information and resources up on our website at waimeatown.org. Uh, we do strive to keep our accounts active and up to date. Uh, this evening, we are streaming both to YouTube and Facebook. I apologize if we have a little bit of tech issue here, but we'll try and work on that throughout the evening. Uh, 
let's see. And this evening, we can also be watched later on uh, for later viewing on both those formats and forums there. At this point, I'd like to recognize my fellow board members, our Vice President, Mary Beth Lechek, our Treasurer, Jeremy Madrid, who I don't believe is here with us tonight, our Secretary, Nancy Carr Smith, and our Directors, Riley Smith, Lonnie Olson Chong, David Greenwell, and Patty Cook. And on behalf of the Waimea Community Association Board, we are grateful for the support shown by you, the community, to hold these town meetings. Thank you for your interest in joining our past meetings, uh, for viewing and sharing these recordings. Uh, we're also grateful for the generosity of Tutu's House, the transition our meetings, and reincorporate an in-person aspect. We are thrilled to bring our meetings in person while maintaining a virtual presence uh, that the community has appreciated over the past couple of years now. The Waimea Community Association is a nonprofit organization that strives to promote open participation by all the Waimea community, develop leadership, and support the smart growth of the region. If you would like to support the work that we have done and continue our effort in connecting with the community, you are more than welcome to join and, and donate as a member. Uh, please visit our website at waimeatown.org or send us an email at waimeacommunityassociation at gmail.com for more information. Your contributions and your membership allow us to reach out and connect to the community in this setting and support the work that WC has done for the past 60 years. Mahalo nui. So for our agenda this evening, our main focus will be with uh, connecting and learning about, learning more about our Hawaii County Planning Department and with our director for the County Planning Department this evening. And we'll also be spending some time with a few special guests and our South Pole police officers. We also have allocated time this evening to share your questions with our presenters. And we appreciate community members sending in their questions ahead of time. Uh, for our viewers online, please use the live chat to pose your questions. We'll try and capture them and do our best there. And for those attending in person, we have a couple of note cards. If you could use those and send your question, and then we will present them to our presenters here. Uh, we'll do our best to answer and address as many questions as possible this evening. Thank you. So this time, I'd like to welcome up Captain Evangelista. And we have on the screen with us here, uh, CPOs Ansel Robinson and CPO Justin Cabantin to share with us a few updates. Thanks, James. Yes, thanks, Captain. Hi, everybody. Hi. Nice to see everybody in person tonight. Um, we'll go ahead and lead off with Officer Cabantin. He has some information for us and part of our crime report. And then Officer Robinson will follow up with the rest of the crime report. And then I have just a quick announcement at the end. So take it away, guys. Thank you, Cap. Um, good evening, everyone. Officer Cabanting, for those of you that um, didn't meet me yet. But uh, just a couple announcements. Um, Cherry Blossom, everybody knows, is going to be in Waimea this Saturday. Our newsletter is going to come out soon. Um, Super Bowl Sunday, please stay safe as we gather. You know, please drive safe. And one last thing, coffee with the cop before I get started. That's going to be on the 17th. That's a Friday. And that's going to be down at the Queen Shops in Waikoloa uh, Resort area, uh, 7 o'clock to 10. But I'll get started with the crime report. So for the month of January, we did have three assaults um, in the South Koala District. Thanks, James. In the South Koala District, uh, we had zero burglaries reported. And although we did have 10 criminal property damage investigations initiated in our South Koala District. So um, doesn't mean there wasn't any burglaries, but there was none reported. But I'll give it off to Officer Robinson. He'll take it off from there. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Officer Robinson. Thanks for having me tonight. Uh, picking up on that CPD, yes, there was a noticeable increase uh, while it's preliminary and we're still investigating things. We believe that several of these can be tied to one individual, and we're currently working on that investigation. Um, other than that, everything else seems to be in line with uh, normal numbers. So theft about 15, or exactly 15. Uh, we had no robberies, again, uh, one uh, UCPV or auto theft, and three UEMVs or unauthorized entry in motor vehicle. Uh, I would just like to remind the public um, that to ensure the safety of our community further, I encourage everyone to be vigilant and report any suspicious activity to the police. By working together, we can help to make our district a safer place to live, work, and raise our families. Um, and also emphasize our role in crime prevention, keeping our communities secure. 
So small actions such as securing your doors and windows, installing home security systems, and being mindful of your neighborhood can greatly contribute to reducing crime in our area. As you can see, a large number of our um, thefts, uh, UCPVs and UEMVs, or unauthorized entry into a vehicle, um, were linked to having unlocked unsecured property. So please do your part. Thank you. That's all I have. And I'll turn it over to Captain. So if you if you were to subtract the, the linked ones out, the numbers do fall more in line with what we typically experience month over month. Um, like he was saying, we really look to our public to help us by not becoming victims of crimes or making it harder to become a victim of crime. Lock your doors. Uh, don't take your valuables to the beach. Secure them. Um, the last thing I have, James, if you have that graphic for us, I just want to, we're really pushing the community survey. It went live yesterday. Um, there's a QR code that people can snap a picture of. Uh, we can email it out. If you subscribe to our newsletter, it's going to be in our newsletter. It's on, our Facebook uh, page. It's on Waimea Community Association's Facebook page. Um, in 2019, we had, I, I don't know the number, we had X amount of respondents to the survey. 2021, that number doubled. And what we're hoping for is for it to double again. We want the community participation. We want people to tell us what we're doing well, what they think we could be doing better. We, we need that data so that we can improve our operations and help serve the public better. So please encourage everybody you know to do the survey. Thanks. Any questions? Just a comment that the survey is confidential and there is a place on it to, I'm just because I did it, there's a place on it to actually put in your thoughts. So there's some simple you know, Q&A or just you know yes and no, but there is an opportunity to actually there you're loving a lot. Thanks. Yes. Are uh, there possible to put like a graphic where where the occurrences were? So that is something that we can look at for. We can look at it. We can look at possibly issuing a graphic in the news. Like yeah. if, if it's more in one area than might be something that people in that area might be more concerned about. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. We can look into that. Anything else? All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Still, still battling the tech a little bit, but here, uh, so we'll do our best what we can. So thanks, everyone, for your patience. Okay, so thank you, Captain. Thank you, officers. I appreciate the service you do for our communities. Uh, let's see. Well, this Saturday is a big, big day in the community here. I uh, hope you're all excited for this Saturday. I know I'm sure I am. Uh, with the return of the Waimea Cherry Blossom Heritage Festival, we are grateful to be joined by uh, Margo Bunnell, uh, Hawaii Island General Manager for Roberts Hawaii, and a member of the Cherry Blossom Heritage Festival Planning Committee to share with us information about the event and this long way to return. Thank you, Margo. Aloha, thank you. Thank you everybody for having me. Um, we're really, really excited that after being hiatus for three years in virtual, that it's live. So I don't know if you folks have seen the Facebook. I don't know if you've seen the, heard it on the radio, but um, it's from nine to three. Um, starting, you can start from Honganji. We have shuttles running. So Roberts is providing for shuttles. We have a new location, and our new location is the Pukalani Stables, and we have a surprise celebrity chef, and I can't announce it because he said I can. So Chef Alan Wong is coming at one o'clock to participate. Um, I think most of you don't know that he is of Japanese heritage. It means a lot to us that is Japanese to share the heritage. And um, there's a lot of things that will be happening. So if you get to look at the map, that's a great map. Also, there will be QR codes on top of the bus because the programs are changing. Um, you can see anything 
from uh, KTA stores to Honganji to Parker Ranch Center, Kukulani Stables. Um, I have a question. Yeah. When is the Taiko drumming? So the main Taiko drumming that yes. we all like to watch yes. um, will be at two o'clock yes. at the Parker Ranch Center um, okay. behind. Yes. And that's Tai Shoji. Um, so all of the other stages will end at two oh. so that you can get there. And see it. So yeah, Thank it's going to be o'clock. great. Okay. Two o'clock. Um, sake tasting also. Alvin at Kamuela Liquor has brought in the sake master that's from 12 noon to um three. i believe three yeah 12 to three there's a lot going in my head um and the quoting club is back where a quoting that they're going to be showing the quotes and that be across of the kahilu theater it's not on the map there's lots of things going on where you are you get to participate so um, <coughs> any other questions i can answer about cherry blossom yes, what are yeah questions? are you going to have um the big you had booths with sale, all kinds of items for sale. Is that going to happen again this year? Um, there are the crafters. Or oh, yeah, I'm not sure what New Hope is doing, but okay. I know that that whole church row is um, is going to be bubbling, um, and even Kep. So Kep has yeah okay. crafters too. It's it's going to be pretty Thank crazy, you. but we're excited. So please come out, come see us, and hopefully you guys all can come out. Yeah. Is there any question? No. Um, and just in, you know, with, with Margo and Robert's Way, we do recommend using the shell as much as possible. Parking, you know, is, is probably going to be a little crazy in town. Cars are going to pretty much block up the road. So recommend using the shuttles or walking as much as possible. So shuttles are running from 8.30 to 3.30, but we'll still have the last shuttle running for any tricklers that are around. <laughs> yeah. So. Is it parking at the state facility, the civic center? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you mean across from the um the yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It will be. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much. <laughs> I also wanted to share just a couple of other uh, community events that are happening. Things are coming up. Uh, so let me just share my screen here and put a couple of slides up. Uh, this is a webinar that's happening uh, next week, actually. Uh, put on by Legal and Voters and Civil Beat about ranked choice voting. So if you'd like to log on to this, you can scan the QR code. It'll take you right to the Eventbrite website where you can log in and sign up for that. It's a free webinar, um, and you can learn more about ranked choice voting, which we pass as a state for special elections and so forth going forward. So something to look forward to and something to learn about if you're interested in that. And then one other thing here with the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. They are still offering uh, home assessments, free home assessments uh, for those that live in kind of a wildfire prone area and those that are near a uh, firewise neighborhood designated area. Those are free uh, while funding lasts, of course. And this is really an informational and an educational walkthrough at your own home or your property, about 30 to 60 minutes. And you kind of inform you about the issues on your site or challenges you may face there. Just want to share a couple of those on the screen. And lastly, uh, we do try our best to post as much as we can on our Facebook page and social media accounts, even some up on our website. But just wanted to highlight a couple of these that are happening in the community and things that are coming forward. And then, of course, lastly, COVID-19 is still <laughs> a Juliana, still an issue we're facing and dealing with. Uh, it's still in our schools and so forth. So as always, please stay home. If you're feeling under the weather, wear masks, wear when appropriate, get tested if you suspect exposure. And please consider getting vaccinated if you haven't had the chance to do so. We're grateful for the ongoing support of our medical community uh, through these months as we dealt with COVID and other respiratory viruses. And we do also try and plan, we're trying to plan uh, community health care providers to join us here at future meetings, to talk about these similar issues and other community <laughs> health issues as well. All right. And for the month of February, the Waimea Community Association is Police and Spotlight Habitat for Humanity as our nonprofit of the month. Uh, with a recent build effort in Phi High, and not to mention the demand for affordable housing, uh, we felt it pertinent to hear from community members uh, that are making this happen. And so tonight we're joined by Patrick Kearney, the Executive Director for Hawaii Island Habitat for Humanity, to share with us about the work being carried out to support our fellow community members 
and the opportunities to get involved. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Jameson. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, Patrick Kearney with Habitat for Humanity, Hawaii Island. Um, I've been with the organization for 14 years. Um, I live in Waimea. I've been in Waimea for, found this out today after doing the survey, over 25 years. So um, really, really um, uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, just want to kind of give an overview real quick of what we're doing and what we do and how it works a little bit. But uh, this is really one of our philosophies. Everyone deserves a decent place to call home. Uh, this family, we just did a, a blessing at their house in um, Hawaiian Acres, a four bedroom, two bath, uh, a single mother of five children, um, part of the, uh, the, the long-term disaster recovery from Kilauea. Um, over the years, uh, we've built uh, 62 homes scattered across the island. Uh, we do new homes for home ownership, and we do some critical home repairs. We try to, we, we also try to preserve the housing inventory by doing critical home repairs for um, mostly Kupuna. So, uh, a quote that I want to share with you from our most famous volunteer: Habitat gives us an opportunity which is very difficult to find to reach out and work side by side with those who've never had a decent home, but work with them on a completely equal basis. It's not a big shot, little shot relationship, but it's a sense of equality. And really, President Carter really sums up the essence of Habitat. It's about partnership. It's about working together, getting the families, uh, the volunteers out to build uh, homes uh, um, for, for low-income families. Um, we are part of Habitat International. Uh, we operate in 70 different countries around the world. And since uh, 1976, we've built 42 million homes around the world. So right. it is a worldwide network of builders. Uh, so please, if you get a chance to come out and be part of that network, uh, mm -hmm. there are opportunities. Um, we are a Christian housing ministry uh, dedicated to provide uh, affordable home ownership opportunities. We're all about uh, uh, home ownership. Um, the founder of Habitat, Millard Fuller, used to say uh, before he passed, he said, the poor don't need caseworkers, they need capital. And that's what the secret is of Habitat, of pro providing families with generational um, assets that they can pass on and, and stop the generational cycle of poverty. Um, there are 1,500 affiliates in the U.S. and Canada, five affiliates in the, in the state of Hawaii. Um, there were two on this island in, in 2017. We merged uh, West Hawaii with the Hilo affiliate, and now we're Hawaii Island. Uh, we serve families that uh, make between 80 and 30 percent of the median income. So um, the county of Hawaii median income is like for a family of four, it's around 79,000 um, annually. So a family of four making about 72 down to about 25, 26,000. So that's the, the demographic uh, of the families we serve. Um, <clears throat> how it works in a nutshell, the first thing we need to do is identify 100% of the funding. Uh, once we do that, uh, once we're able to purchase the materials uh, with that money, then we can proceed. Uh, we select the partner families based on level of need, willingness to partner, and uh, the ability to pay back a mortgage. So we, we do a, a, a lengthy selection process with our committee. Um, they, they do home visits and make sure the families are are, are stable, they have a history of paying their debts back, and uh, will be uh, willing partners uh, going forward. We build the home with volunteer labor and the partner family. Um, the partner families need to put in 500 hours of sweat equity into their home. Um, and that's really the first subsidy that goes into the home, the volunteer labor. We estimate that the volunteer labor piece uh, reduces the cost of construction by 35 to 40 percent. Um, and then uh, once the home is built, then we sell the home to the family and provide a 30 year mortgage. Uh, it's, uh, depending on the funding source, uh, if it's Habitat's funding, there's no mortgage. 
there's no interest, excuse me. Uh, but if there's a third party funding, a lot of times there's a small uh, interest on, on the loans, but it is a, it, there is no profit that's made on the homes. To protect the equity that goes into the homes, we place a soft second mortgage behind the first. So for example, our homes uh, that we built in Waikoloa a few years ago, um, it cost us about 200,000. We had them appraised once we were finished and they were about 400,000. So there's 200,000 in equity. So to protect uh, a family from trying to speculate the market and make a windfall, if they if they want to sell the house, they have to repay the first, and then that silent second or soft second kicks in, and they have to repay that as well. So uh, that's the protection that goes into it. We don't give away the homes. These families are hardworking and deserving um, families that just haven't had that uh, leg up or able to climb that ladder of success yet. Uh, uh, so, um, and then finally. Uh, we become the banker and we service the mortgages. So the payments that come into Habitat um, then go into a fund for humanity to, uh, to support more builds. So it is a ripple effect. The more homes that we build, the more revenue we get each month from those builds. So um, that's kind of the phenomenon too of Habitat. And that's why the growth of it is so um, enormous. The impact that we can have on our families in the community um, is incredible. You know, right now, island wide, this is kind of a guesstimate. Uh, the average cost of a home is about 220, or excuse me, 520,000. I wish it was 220,000. Uh, but we all know the markets are completely different from the west side to the east side. So that's kind of a median um, average cost. The average cost of a habitat house today is about 255,000. Um, over 30 years, that's a monthly mortgage payment of about 800 bucks a month. Now, the average rent uh, on the island is about 1800 bucks a month, if you can find a place to rent. There is absolutely no place to rent in Waimea, I'm sorry, <laughs> unless you get willing to pay like 3500 bucks a month. So uh, we are in a housing crisis and we really need to invest in uh, more homes, for, especially if we want our KK to stay home, um, we, we need to build uh, more homes uh, uh, in our community. Why home, home ownership matters? Uh, first and foremost, uh, wealth accumulation. Um, in the United States, the net worth of a homeowner is, is around 195,000. The net worth of a renter is about $5,400. And that's usually a vehicle that's depreciating. A home is gonna appreciate. So the family will gain um, um, equity into their asset. And we believe that this is the key to ending poverty, um, to, to provide that uh, a family with an affordable mortgage. Uh, we basically take a family and lift them out of poverty simply by providing them that mortgage. The social benefits, we could talk for an hour about that. Children do better in school, academically, behaviorally, socially, um, better health outcomes, lower crime and drug rates, uh, and the community becomes more engaged with home ownership. We all know that. And um, the lastly is the economy. Home construction is a key indicator of the economy with a multiplier effect. And there's one job created for every two homes that are sold. So uh, it is it is an economic burner for, for our economy as well. Um, over the last five years, we've served 75 families, 42 new homes, uh, 32 critical home repairs, <clears throat> 4,300 uh, volunteers and 42,000 volunteer hours uh, in our community. Currently, <clears throat> we are building seven homes, uh, three in Puna right now, part of the long-term Puna recovery, one in Ocean View and three down in Kauai High on Hawaiian homelands. We try to do at least uh, four critical home repairs uh, a quarter. We partner with DHHL to build. Most of our homes are on DHL, DHHL um, leasehold properties. And uh, we are looking forward to using the HPM modular uh, housing product uh, um, soon, where we can uh, expedite the building process and get families into um, their homes quicker. And we're always looking for opportunities to build um, uh, in one spot. Right now, we're 
at all corners of the island. It'd be nice to have, uh, you know, 10 acres where we can build 30 homes that be there for a year and, and really work it out. But right now we're driving all over the place trying to build homes and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. So we're always looking for opportunities. During the pandemic, we uh, hooied with about six other nonprofits to do the emergency rental assistance program. Um, we distributed uh, $24 million of rental assistance um, during that period. Uh, we spent the last few years before the pandemic really working in uh, the Kilauea eruption area. Some of our funding sources we have, we, we receive money from the county, the state, um, the federal government with home and the HASDA funds. Um, but we also have three restores um, that really provide unrestricted funding to keep our doors open. And I will say this, um, we have two years left on our lease here at the, the old Daniel T. Bowes place. Um, and we, we're struggling. We have a hard time finding employees. Uh, when, we, when we have a full staff, when we have people that go out and pick up donations, that store sells. I mean, it's amazing. But right now, uh, it, it's hard just to keep the doors open. So I beg and plead, if you want to keep the restore in your community, uh, please support it because in, in two years, my board will probably just say, sorry. Uh, the rent at the chalk uh, place is $8,000 a month. So that's a big uh, uh, nut to cover every month. So uh, whatever you can do, spread the word. Please uh, donate right now. We, we can't do pickups. Uh, our truck is down. So we're kind of in trouble. Uh, lastly, uh, thank you for your time. We are all about uh, the kids um, deserving of a stable place to live. And with this program, these families know about what their housing costs are going to be for the next 30 years. You know, if they're renting, their, their housing costs is, you know, $2,000 a month. But 15 years from now, it's going to be, you know, ten, you know five ten thousand dollars $10,000. With this program, it's stability, yeah? And that's what it's all about. So thank you all very much. I think I'm, yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. Right. Thank you, Paul. And then uh, Nancy's going to come around and... Collect if you're if you're so kind and so willing to, to donate towards Habitat for Humanity this evening. Oh, wow. We'll pass the hat here. And then uh, also for our viewers online, uh, you can visit habitatoyiisland.org for more information and ways to support Habitat for Humanity. Thanks again, Patrick. Thank you. All right. I uh, just wanted to check here a little bit, but uh, we're moving on to the final and main portion of our meeting this evening. And so with uh, recent community meetings and ongoing work towards our Hawaii County zoning and subdivision codes update, the evolution of the Electronic Processing Information Center system, also known as EPIC, and forthcoming legislation to the transient accommodation rentals, uh, we wanted to learn more about the work uh, being carried out by the County Hawaii Planning Department. There are many topics and issues that come to mind when we think about planning and the growth of our communities. Uh, to this effect, we want to spend a reasonable amount of time here this evening understanding these challenges and the work we can do as community members to move this conversation forward. So we are grateful to be joined this evening by Hawaii County Planning Department Director Zendo Kern to catch us up to speed and provide us some insight. Welcome, Director. Thanks for joining us. Aloha. It's great to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Um, aloha, yeah, Zendo Kern here. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Apologize I can't be there in person. Uh, I will do my very best to uh, go through a presentation. I generally don't do PowerPoint, so I'm not going to do one, but we will have some fun. I'm going to share a lot of information with you and uh, hopefully get us into some good Q&A. <clears throat> I know we did an update quite some time back. Uh, we've been in here for now uh, two years. I've been director for two years and the two years that it has been. Um, my saying of lately uh, is grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to, think, courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. You know, people ask what, what is it like being in the planning department and it's kind of there's a saying that only a surfer knows the feeling and only once you've been in the backside of it do you really know the challenges that 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 are there and the volume of things we need to work on about 20 years ago i purchased a duplex um 
that was overgrown, couldn't really see it. I knew that it was really run down. I knew that there was a beehive on the backside, but the bushes and everything covered it in such a, a, ray, a manner that you really couldn't get into it. But I thought, you know, um, looked like a decent project as a contractor, might as well get into it. And as we go in there and we clear back the bushes, we notice that there's another beehive and we clear more and there's another beehive and we clear all the bushes around this place and there are five beehives. Like, okay, that's a little bit more than we, we bit off. Then we get in there to open up some of the walls to actually address this bee situation only to find out that there was a fire in that uh, duplex previously and the wood, the studs, the floor joists behind it are burnt. So it turns into this massive can of worms or can of beehives, not unlike coming in as a planning director. And, you know, so here we are in the situation of needing to solve for many different things. We're in a time of climate change. We got housing. Land use is a polarized, uh, challenging situation everywhere. And I'd say Hawaii, it's underscored. And there are a couple elements that I want to focus on. We're going to go over a uh, general overview of what we do, what we've done, and where we're going. There's a couple themes, though, I'd like to add to this. One is certainty. Certainty is very, very, very important on getting things done and moving things forward in our community. And the other is towards versus away. Are we moving towards what we want or away from what we don't want? Are we moving towards what we want or away from what we don't want? For example, I was out uh, in a, a dry land forest about a month ago, uh, talking with this group and just there listening and really trying to, to listen to not only the land, but the, the folks that were there too. And there was an uncle there and this uncle, he was probably, you know, in his eighties and he's playing his ukulele, talking story and, and we're, we're, we're wrapping out. And so I asked him, you know, so what do you think uncle? How, how is it? What, what's your thoughts around, you know, where we're going? And he says, you know, you know, I don't like this place turn into Wahoo. I do not want this place to turn into Wahoo. All right, cool, got it. And he's like, I want to stop the sprawl. Stop the sprawl from sprawling out. Don't turn it into a Wahoo. I was like, okay, got it. And then he's like, you know, I don't like houses so close together. I can hear my neighbor foot. And I said, isn't that a dichotomy? Here we are not wanting sprawl, but also not wanting that connectivity. So I got into what do we want? Where are we going? which really drilled down into another element where I was there talking, or excuse me, listening to this younger man tell a story about what his kapuna shared with him. Three questions. Do the young have opportunity? Do women feel safe in our community? And are the elderly comfortable? Why do we do what we do? It's for those elements. So we can have housing so we can have a safe, sound environment. So our culture is honor honored. We have economics, sense of place, and opportunity. Those are all easy things to say and much harder things to do. And when we're looking at solving many of those elements, a lot of it can come down to certainty. I sit on the TOD Council, which is a transient oriented development council for the state. And I was listening to these folks work on student housing for UH. This is a joint collaboration between the UH, uh, a developer. And so they were using state money, state land, uh, state wasn't state land, state money, um, and this whole complex partnership. And so at the end of it, they explained they're trying to do these few hundred units for student housing. And I asked, I said, you know, if there's one thing, what is the one thing that could actually help you guys move this project forward? Because they'd been there for years. And the guy said, certainty. We are riddled with uncertainty. Will we get our entitlements? Will the community come out in opposition? What's going to happen next? And in order to make these investments, certainty is something that is very needed. And I would agree with that. So I want to talk a little bit about what we do in relation to these two, some of these areas. We have the long range planning division. Uh, we deal with the general plan, uh, CDPs, our community development plans, uh, public access, things of that nature, more longer range, long, long term vision. Uh, we deal with, uh, we also process applications for discretionary permits. So if somebody is doing a change of zone or a use permit or a special permit, we process those and send those to the county, uh, to the planning commission or the county council. Uh, we process ministerial applications for subdivisions, variances, uh, ohanas, additional farm dwellings, etc. We do your GIS mapping, we do your street naming, we do the street addressing. We also advise the mayor, the commissions, the council. 
We handle lava recovery for the 2018 uh, Kilauea eruption. We cut, we hold, um, help manage uh, two planning commissions, six uh, CDP action committees, a uh, cultural resource commission and the Kailua village design commission, as well as a couple others within our department. So there's a lot that's going down uh, and a lot of um, demand and volume at any given day. It is uh, very unique on how much demand you, you think people don't really think about planning that often, but yet it's something that touches everybody's lives from the moment someone's coming into this earth to the moment that they're leaving, they're affected by planning. And once people start, oh my God, what's my neighbor doing? How's that use? Oh, can I have a chicken in my yard? All these things, oh, well, dang it, it's planning. So that volume of, of questions and solving is, is huge. Uh, I love solving problems and land use is one of those. And let me tell you, it's a, it's a good one to be solving. And I'm happy that it's not just me and that I have a good community out there to help along with this. I want to talk a little bit about what we have done uh, to date. Something that has felt very important is that we make decisions. Uh, making decisions is important to create that certainty. If it's a no, I'd like to tell somebody no as quick as we can, or if it's a yes, I'd like to get to that yes. But stalling out and not making decisions doesn't help anybody and it also doesn't build that trust into government. Uh, really trying to create the two-way street. Oftentimes government can be a one-way street, but we're really working and have created a two-way two -way street. So we respond and, and lean into it and, and come from a place of empathy. Uh, since we've come in, we've been 20 to 30% understaffed. That's really intense, 20 to 30% understaffed. So that's 12 to um, potentially 15 team members down at any given time whether it be managers, planners, LUPCs, clerks. I still don't have a clerk for our West Hawaii division, so we are using our clerk in Hilo, and thank goodness for the ethic system, which I'll touch on in just a moment. Um, you know, with that comes challenges, having the staffing. And one of the things that we've tried to do is work on communicating. And so we ran into a situation where we managed the CDPs. We managed the uh, CDPACs, so the Community Development Plan uh, Action Committees. And one, excuse me, our long range division handles that. We have a division within there and we lost a key team member and we lost another key team member. And so we knew that we weren't gonna have that ability to serve the same way that we have been. So there's two kind of ways about going out about it. Kind of typical, um, not say anything and just let it kind of taper off or try to communicate and say, hey, we're, we're having the shortages, we're gonna have to adjust a little bit. And so that's something that we did. I actually caught a lot of flack from it because it was um, kind of perceived in a manner that we weren't trying to, we were saying we're here doing what we can, but I went from having three to four team members to having one, there's gonna be an adjustment. And so what we tried to do through that is actually empower the ACs to go and have the meetings on their own and work with that. And so far for the most part, it's actually been working pretty well and the feedback has been positive. Uh, really trying to come from a place of solutions-based thinking of how do we solve for what we're working on and actually having a dialogue and a, and, and, uh, a proactive approach to things. We went uh, live with Epic. Epic has worked really well for the planning department. Um, we have, we've had to do a lot of work on the back end. We've had to do a lot of training. We've had to respond um, to the department to make sure that our team members are taken care of because it's a completely new system. Uh, I had one of my team members um, about, we've been operating for about a year and a half. And it was two months ago, I was talking to the team member and he said, you know, I really didn't like the Epic system. I didn't want the change, but now I'm actually used to it. I really, really like it. But changing that mindset of pushing through is very challenging, but we got it. So for example, I mentioned that we don't have a clerk in Kona right now. My clerk in Hilo is able to cover that because everything is digital. As we're dealing with um, you know, understaffing, I'm able to move applications around and shift people's workload all online. I don't need to truck things over. I don't need to pouch things over. 
I can move it all around. I can also see everybody's workload a lot better so I can keep balancing it out, see who's performing well and see who's maybe not performing well and give them some uh, encouragement and, and work with them to get that performance level that we have, that we need. We've been working very hard on digitizing uh, things. We have a scanning program within the department. Uh, at times we do up to 35,000 documents a week and trying to get everything digitized so it's it's safe, it's secure with a triple backup, um, but really trying to bring us into the modern age. We're pretty much 95% uh, paperless in the department as it comes to uh, applications and all of the paper that we have is like the old applications that we're digitizing. Came in, there was a massive backlog um, of building permits that has been resolved. We now, uh, on average, we process a building permit in three days. Uh, before uh, West Hawaii, it would take three months to process a building permit. We're down to three days. It's often done in the same day. Uh, and we're working uh, with Department of Public Works for a little bit more um, latitude when it comes to land use review. So we can actually work with the customer on what they need to. Right now, we're just a reviewing um, department when it comes to the building permit. And so if we run into an issue, we actually have to send it back to the building uh, department for them to send back. And then it has to come back through, which causes, you know, bottlenecking. So we're working on that so we can kind of handle that in-house. Um, really working on trying to bring public service back into public service. I think it's really, really important. And something that has been really near and dear to my heart is uh, we're really created, we're creating a bridge. We worked really hard with HR to create a bridge from our frontline folks to be able to go from like an LUPC, which is a land use plan checker, up to a planner and begin to work on being a planner after they've spent a, a long enough time there collecting that, that knowledge and that data. Um, as it was just presented, that we have a lot of folks that need housing or fall into the low to moderate income. Well, I would say that about 40 to 50% of our staff, of our team members that serve you fall into that category. These people fall into the affordable housing, the low income, the very low income. And they are the frontline folks. When you come in to see, some, to see us, those folks fall into that category and there is no housing for them. And yet they're still there serving. And we're trying to work with them. And I got a story. Um, one of the team members, she lived in Hilo. She wanted to, she went through a tough time. She's a single mom. And she wanted to get into the planning department and, and really change her life. The only position that she could get was in the West Hawaii. And she would ride a bus every day. Go work, come back, pick up the kids, do what they had to do, ride the bus. She did that for two years. Till a position opened up in Hilo where she could then be stationed closer to, to home. And she was on the front line there for this entirety is about seven years at least. And she came and said, there is, there's a ceiling here. I, I don't know where I can go. I don't know what I can do. I love serving, but based on how things are with HR right now, I've hit my peak. And I said, you know, that's something that we're working really, really hard on changing um, because I believe that if you put the time in and you have the understanding, there should be a pathway and a bridge for you to move further along. I'm proud to say that she is now a planner and nobody can take that away from her. She's in there, she's processing, um, you know, variance applications and she's working on subdivisions. And she said that her entire life has been changed from that. And to me, that's a big deal and that's why. We're here doing this stuff. So let's talk about what's coming up next. We are working to improve, continue to improve our service and our systems. That's the constant and it's, con and it's gonna need constant attention. It's like a garden, you gotta keep watering it and working on it and pulling the weeds out. And to me that, that should never end, constant never ending improvement. We are working on a climate action plan. It is uh, in partnership with um, research and development, and it's a, a climate action plan focused on both mitigation and resilience. And the first focus of that is on the county. So we're facing it inwards before it goes outwards. And that is going to be, you know, electrifying our fleet, understanding the energy uses with our buildings, changing our lighting, changing the way we actually um, 
contract with things, changing how we use. And actually, we talk about sustainability. We want to be sustainable. The county has to lead the charge with that. And this climate action plan is a framework to move that forward and to be able to add on and to build on. And it's also going to go to inform how do we make decisions about, you know, assets and resources because sea level is rising. We do have vulnerable areas. Fortunately, uh, compared to some of the other islands, we do not have as much vulnerability, but we do have vulnerable areas. And so decisions need to be made now as we're making uh, CIP um, uh, requests and capital expenditures in these areas. And so this climate action plan, we're hoping it's going to be out um, Pretty sure it will be out this year and um, we'll get some feedback around that and again it's something that will be built upon but it's really exciting that it's really it's it's moving forward and i believe you know now is that 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 time to really try to get ahead of the game um, and continue to uh to adjust as needed uh, we're working on the cdp action committees uh, it's been a lot of discussion around the cdp action committees and we want to get the CDP ACs so they're empowered and they're working and it actually serves community. Um, we are working right now on filling seats. Uh, we have a good number of these ACs. So we've gone and we started kind of from the first uh, ACs and we started filling those seats. So good thing is, is the South Kohala CDP is up next to be filling those seats. Uh, we're working right now with the mayor's office on collecting um, folks that are interested in getting nominations together for people that want to serve. Right now we do have the AC, but there are many holdovers. And so you should be seeing that within your community. If you're interested, please submit an application to the mayor's office. Um, and also we sent out a survey uh, to existing a a AC, ACs, action committees, uh, as well as people into the public trying to get feedback on how's it working, what could be adjusted. So we've collected a lot of data and we're now we're taking that in and looking to make um, appropriate adjustments based on the feedback that we're getting from community. It's still a, it's a it's a you know community based approach. We're trying to get that feedback so it, so they really really work and understand what is working and what isn't working. Uh, something else that we're working on are our shoreline setbacks, a science-based shoreline setback. Um, many of you may know our previous shoreline setbacks were 20 feet uh, on certain parcels and 40 feet when the depth of the parcel allowed. Uh, Act 16, which came into effect about two years ago, which was the uh, Senate bill, it created it to be a minimum of 40 foot uh, setback. And then there were other provisions in there like no hardening of the shoreline, et cetera. So we're looking at our island and the uniqueness of our island and say, does 40 feet work everywhere? And the answer is 40 feet doesn't necessarily work everywhere. In certain areas, 40 feet is fine. Uh, in other areas, that's not the case. So for example, on our polys, on our steep cliffs that can shear off, is 40 feet enough? We're thinking it isn't. We're modeling the Hamakua Coast right now. This is in joint um, collaboration with the UH and understanding the light, LIDAR, which is uh, basically topographic uh, imagery along that coast, understand what's happening there. And we're looking at a setback for something like that, where it's basically a rise and run. So for every foot up, it's about a foot and a half in. And so you create that, that degree back. So if it was a hundred foot cliff, the setback would be 150 feet. This is just what we're looking at right now. It's gonna come out for public uh, input, public review, and ultimately have to go through uh, getting codified. And then the other area that we're, that we're working on and trying to model is, is what are we gonna use for sea level rise? Sea level is rising. Um, the other, um, some of the other counties, Oahu, Kauai, they have uh, Slurexa, the sea level rise exposure area, and a lot better detail. Um, it's a gentleman by the name of Clip, uh, Chip Fletcher that um, works at, uh, with the UH that's modeled out there. And that's a lot of the focus. Big Island hasn't had that focus. We're also fortunate in the way that we don't have as many beaches and many low-lying areas that are eroding, um, but we have our other unique areas. And so we're trying to model where do we hit this benchmark for sea level rise expected to be 
in 2100? And how do we make decisions based off of that being a setback or having enough height or free board? Uh, as well as how do we look at it then from a county asset place, which ties back to that climate action plan? And so these are kind of the model that we're looking at is one of three choices and whatever one is greater based on data, based on logic, based on a, a pragmatic approach, not based on a feeling. And so expect that to be coming out uh, some point this year. Uh, we've also talked with uh, the Department of Public Works and there's connection to chapter 27 um, and, and working with them on that. Chapter 27 basically handles uh, flood, flood areas, which a lot of our coastline is deemed a flood area. We're also looking at riparian setbacks. Riparian setback, um, if you don't know, if that's, a, that's a river. Uh, we actually have a number of rivers here and believe it or not, there are no riparian setbacks in, on Hawaii County. So you can build as close as you want to, as long as you hold off your property line for the setback. And that poses its own unique set of challenges from a health and safety perspective and also an environmental uh, place. And, and so we're looking at that, wanna get, wanna get feedback on that and model something that's gonna work uh, really, really well. Um, actually, I'm hosting a delegation from Palau right now, uh, Palau, the island out there, or that little islands out there. Um, and we're doing a zoning exchange with them, kind of going over our processes, our zoning. And we talk with them and a lot of their water is actually surface, surface water that they use. And they have a tremendous amount of rivers and they have riparian setbacks of, 50, of 60 feet over there. And so it's interesting to see while they're learning from us on some of this other modern contemporary uh, zoning and processing, they've, they've really got a mindset around, you know, protecting their critical resources, which is, you know, the balance that we're working on here, right? And so we have a TAR bill. So you guys probably have all heard STVR, short-term vacation rentals, and how that's been regulated. Um, bill 108 came out a few years ago and, and regulated unhosted short-term vacation rentals. And it was basically that it, it, the definition was a single family dwelling uh, rented out for 30 days or less that the owner is not present. And so at the time, the concept was, and I wasn't at the director at that, at that time, based on my understanding and conversations with the director, and I was very close to this conversation, was the next phase was to come out and look at um, doing hosted, uh, short, hosted rentals, as well as potentially creating some vacation destination nodes in areas that don't have resorts, that don't have hotel rooms, but have a, a visitor need or a high concentration of STVRs and a community that's kind of in the mindset of that transient uh, type um, visitors. So for example, one area could be like Volcano Village. There's really no accommodations up there. There's, there's STVRs, there's bed and breakfasts, um, but there's no, there's no hotels. There's nothing like that up there and it's right next to the national park. So that could be an area uh, that might make sense for that. And so what happened was um, that was uh, the, the short-term vacation rentals, transient accommodations do affect our housing inventory. Um, they also, have opportunities for folks to create income, for locals to create income, and to find this balance. So how do we find a balance by regulating it? Now, as coming into this position, we see as a director that there's a tremendous amount of uh, challenge in regulating short-term vacation rentals when you only have one classification. Uh, in talking with Chair uh, Heather Kimball, council member, um, she was very, uh, had the mindset of wanting to really get this legislation going as well. So she took the lead as long as, as well as uh, council member Ashley Kirkowitz on drafting le legislation. And we have been working with them, myself and my deputy director have been working with them on working through this legislation. And so what it is, is it's really a completely new, um, repeal the old section of the code and put this entire new section in. And the big takeaways on it are everybody who had uh, received an STVR permit or received a non-conforming use certificate, 
those I'll maintain. You have all the property rights that you always had. Those, those will be there. They just will end up being called TARs instead of STVRs. I'm not sure if that's actually going to change, but TAR is transient accommodation rental. And the next goal, the next element to that is to bring hosted rentals into the fold. So people that actually have a host on site, they might buy a property and then they have a host living there and people come and rent that out. Um, that will be regulated within certain, will be allowed within certain districts and it won't be allowed in other districts. Um, folks that are in um, legal operations will have the opportunity to be grandfathered in, uh, basically creating another le um, layer of non-conforming use, um, yeah, NUCs, non-conforming use certificates for hosted rentals. The, that is for a hosted rental that is not the actual owner that lives there. Now we have a, a section in there that says, if it's your house and you live there, then you can rent out you know, your rooms if you want to. As long as you're there, you can do that as a way to you know, create some additional income um, and to provide the owner some latitude on what they can do with their house. We get very few complaints when it's the actual owner there because they know their neighbors. They understand that people aren't gonna be having big parties. It's a completely different story when the owner lives there, even different than a host. And so the other big change will be that is being proposed is that the duration, instead of an STVR or a TAR being defined as uh, 30 days or less, it's looking at 180 days or less. That's consistent with um, a lot of other state state laws that talk about, you know, taxing, uh, transient accommodation tax. So that was the mindset there. And to give everybody, you know, the opportunity that is operating the ability to move forward. But at the end of the day, um, on one other classification that if you live there, it's your home. And let's say you're, you know, you're going on vacation, you're going to go skiing for a couple of weeks that you will have the opportunity to rent out your house unhosted for a short period of time. Uh, right now, it's no longer than four total weeks for the entire year and no longer than two weeks at any time. And so, you know, that kind of gives a little bit of latitude. Some folks don't feel comfortable leaving without having somebody there because it's a way that they watch their house. It's also a way to, you know, help offset an income. And in time that we've seen massive inflation, it's an opportunity for people to utilize that. And so those are the, the, the categories. And at the end of the day, all of them will have some type of registration number. That will then allow uh, easy, much easier enforcement and understanding of what's really happening. It'll also allow the opportunity to create relationships and agreements with the, um, with the platforms such as Airbnb and um, you know, uh, VRBO, et cetera. So following behind that is an ADU or additional dwelling or Ohana legislation. And this is some low hanging fruit when it comes to solving for affordable housing. How do we get make it easier for folks to build Ohana's on their land uh, on their on, you know, with they already have the existing home and they could rent that out long term. They could have family live there. It could be a combination, um, but it, it really creates housing and it doesn't create as much speculation as just single family on its own. So the goal is to open that up with parameters and framework to, to really have it be used for housing, longer range housing. And so that will follow, that's gonna be following right behind this um, STVR legislation, which the concept was that the ADUs came out first and the um, STVR legislation wasn't resolved, then we would get into this massive uh, issue where many people are just using their HANAs for a short-term vacation rental and not actually solving the housing needs that we have. And so this is a, a complicated subject. It's, it's some people love it, some people hate it, some people are in the middle. For myself, I'm trying to navigate and find balance in something that works to the best of our ability for, for all folks. Very hard to do. So um, keep 
keep your eye out for this. It will be, the process will be, we've done a couple um, kind of open house public outreach meetings, just putting it out there, collecting feedback, adjusting, adjusting. Oh crap, didn't miss that one over there and it fixed it and put it back out. But what will happen is it'll be introduced at council by um, Chair Kimball and um, Council Member Kirkowitz. And then it'll be deferred to the planning, referred to the planning department, where we will go through and process it and do a background report and make a recommendation and get into the weeds on it a bit more. And we'll send that through to the planning commissions. That'll go through both Windward Planning Commission and Leeward Planning Commission. They will have the opportunity to look at, you know, we'll do public hearings there. They could look at amending it. Um, and ultimately, they'll make a recommendation to the county council, favorable or unfavorable, um, and that'll get to the council. And then the council will have the opportunity to go into deliberation and figure out how the actual bill is going to come out and hopefully comes out you know, in a reasonable fashion. I expect it'll probably make its way to the council in about six months. I believe it will probably come up at council here in the next month or so, and then make its way to me and then through that process that we just talked about. Um, so another two areas that we're going to touch on are is the general plan. I know it's a long, long awaiting uh, general plan. The general plan we are working on is it's one of my primary focuses, and it's one of the more challenging things to do. Uh, when we came in, there was an existing um, some we had the existing general plan, we had a draft that was there and a lot of feedback, a lot of input from community. But the drafts needed a lot of work and we based on the feedback we're kind of merging both some of the original plan some of the draft and the feedback working on creating a plan that is concise and clear right now the draft that i have i think it's still too it's still still too specific it's still too complicated and what i realize is that complicated is easy simple, concise, and effective is challenging. And so we are working on that every single week, going through it, making adjustments, and trying to get a plan that really addresses our aspirations on where we want to be as an island, a beautiful, self-sustaining island that honors our people, that honors our culture, that has the opportunities, that manages growth, and that not only just tells the public what to do, but it can also, and this is really important to me, it points inward and tells the county what to do. And for example, when we're working on infrastructure, you can get very siloed. We might be resurfacing a road and there is a water line and a sewer line underneath there that's in desperate need of repair, yet the departments aren't, aren't talking. So we may be gonna go resurface the road, have to come back later, rip the road back up, to put in the water line or sewer line that we need for the projects or growth within that urban area, then the plan is to hopefully mandate that they all have to work together, at least touch base with each other and understand what we're all doing. And I, I think that's something that's really, really important because the continuity of how the counties moved along is very challenged. We have a lot of deferred maintenance. We have a lot of infrastructure needs. And in a lot of ways, I feel like a lot of things have just been swept into that closet. You've all seen in the movies where you just keep, you know, throwing everything in the closet. And finally, one day you open up the door and it all comes out and you just can't put it back in. That's the situation that we're in. We got the Gila wastewater treatment plant. It is in dire need of repair a lot. Of, and we're and we're working on it. But so much money is going there when it's frustrating that if there was a better maintenance program, it was done better, it would be in much better shape. And we could be focusing our money and our CIP efforts in the areas that we need it more to create more housing, because unfortunately, that doesn't actually create more housing, it just fixes a problem. So the general plan, we're going through working with the departments right now, streamlining, uh, working with some stakeholders, we're going to have it come back out for public input, we're going to hold uh, public meetings, and we're going to collect more in info on that, and then it's going to make its way to the Planning Commission and then to County Council. All of that is happening this year. The goal is to get it to Commission and Council at the beginning of, of 24 at the latest. And, um, you know, one would think that it's pretty straightforward, but as I say, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty tricky to be honest with you and i'm enjoying working on it i'm enjoying the challenge um i don't back down from challenges and this one is, is right there again simple and concise is, is is tricky complicated is easy now with that 
we thought that you know updating our, our codes would be about time. Our subdivision codes in 19, based in 1983, our zoning codes based in 1996. And there's a lot of, of room for, for movement and getting them to a more modern contemporary place with a lot of lessons learned over the years as well. So we're proud that we've announced, uh, we've, we've initiated a, a code update and we brought on consultants to work with us. And right now we're in the process of collecting a lot of uh, info. We've done open houses, as you folks know, on we've done them. Uh, and in Kona, Waimea, Hilo, Kau, and trying to collect that feedback and get the community feedback, what's working, what's not working, as well as taking the institutional knowledge within the department and uplifting that in there. A lot of the feedback that we have received is, you know, the general plan needs to be in front of it. There's a lot of low hanging fruit on the code, but the general plan still needs to, to lead it. I totally agree with that. And so right now there's a lot of work being done on the back end or there will be on the code and the formatting, getting the fixes in there, getting some language. And as the general plan continues to move forward, that'll be adjusted based on any feedback. And then the general plan will finally come out and be adopted ultimately by the county council. And, and once that's done, will come forth with the necessary code updates. There's a lot of stuff happening on the back end. Knowing how long everything takes and time takes, it's critical to get these things working in the, on the backside of things and get that momentum going. Because um, like I say, this is uh, things, things, things certainly do take a while. So if anybody's interested in the code update, we, do, we have online, uh, we have a website at cohcodeupdate.com. Um, that's COH, like County of Hawaii, codeupdate.com. And we're able to collect feedback and that'll be a great way to interface. We'll be coming back out to, to the public, showing it and it's gonna have an entire process of more public input, uh, showing what's going on. And it will ultimately have to go to the planning commissions as well as through to the county council for final uh, adoption. What we want to see is that is that proper connection between general plan and code. And some of the areas might be, you know, smaller lot sizes. That's certainly something that we work with. Right now, infrastructure is so expensive for our lots. Right now, our, our smallest lot size is 7,500 square feet. And you really have to have, um, you know, sewer system for that to work, because otherwise the Department of Health requires a 10,000 square foot lot for a septic system. Modern planning actually has lot sizes that can go down to like 3,500 square feet, 4,000 square feet. And when you get that, you can actually spread that infrastructure cost much further out. And we start to get things down to much more affordable range. And so also really trying to work on this live work play model. I mean, Waimea is a great area for that. It kind of already has that going on where you can get Theoretically, you know, you could you could ride the bus, good transit service. You could you ride your bike in certain areas. You could collect, you know, jump on an EV or do sh shared ride. And, and and the model hopefully is to continue in that that direction because that's really that's that's modern planning, especially when you take in climate change and the cost of everything. The live work play model, which is interesting because in a lot of ways it takes us back. It takes us back to plantation era. Think about plantation. It was tight clustered uh, areas. You had work around it. You had parks, you had recreation, you had your school. You didn't have to go that far. Since then, we've moved out into this more sprawl, suburbanization, and now the theme is drive. And that does, that's not sustainable. So we're really excited about all these efforts. And I wanna come back real quick to this concept and I challenge all of us, and this is what I'm trying to work on really too, and embedding it into our general plan is, what do we want? Are we moving towards what we want or away from what we don't want? One of the things that's near and dear and passionate to my heart is the children of our island and the fact that our children are our biggest export, that's not cool. That needs to change. And I was really, really excited to um, be a part of this program for uh, Lead for Hawaii. And it was a fellowship program where it was trying to uplift locals um, and leadership in there. And there was a gentleman by the name of Paka Davis who was born and raised Big Island uh, from Kona side. He went off to the college. He went to, uh, um, he was in Texas, went to college, had his great scholarship, football player. The guy is just a really good guy. He was over there making really good money in Texas. He came back home, visited his mom. This Lead for Hawaii program uh, was in the newspaper. And his mom said, you need to call and check these guys out and see what's going on with that. So he did. He reached out to the program. 
they uh, interviewed him and, and kind of vetted him out. I got the opportunity to interview him. And I said, yes, I'd love to take him on as a fellow and I'd be able to work with him. And so he worked within the planning department with me. He's running, you know, doing about 35 hours a week um, within the planning department, another five hours outside there for leadership skills, leadership training, community uh, engagement, just trying to really round the guy out. And so here he is, you know, young man, got a really, really sharp, great attitude, gets it, a balanced guy, you know, master's degree, and he came home and he's making much less money at this time than he was in Texas, but he feels good. He's home. He's seeing his family. He's a part of his home now. And he's like, I would never have gotten back here if it wasn't for this program. That's cool. And, you know, here we are, we're coming kind of, we're, I had him for a year and a half. And I've seen this, this guy, this young man grow and I'm mentoring him and I've never been a mentor. And it's kind of weird because I've always been mentored, but I'm over here trying to, you know, help this, help this young man move along. And next thing you know, he is interviewing with Queen Lilio Kalani Trust for their resource manager um, on the island. And he goes through all of the interview processes and he gets the job. And he said that he would have never gotten that job if he had not gone through the mentorship program that he did. And if that program had not existed, he probably would not have been back home. So how can we keep the children here or have them come home? How can we have the opportunity for our young, know that our women are safe in our community and our elderly are comfortable? And with that, I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Kern. Appreciate you uh, maneuvering through all those different topics and touching on many different things there. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to open up the floor here. We have two of our board members, Nancy Carr Smith and Mary Beth Lechek. They're going to address you with a couple different questions from the from the community here that's in the room. Some that we may have had online, and then ones that we received ahead of time. Hi, Auntie so Nancy. I'll pass over to Nancy, yeah. Mary Beth. Hey, Linda, thank you so much for that presentation. So our first one is on um, dark skies enforcement. So what do business, what processes do businesses have to follow in obtaining permits for specified outdoor lighting? Um, particularly, there's been some rumors that the Longs and Waimea is going to make a big shift in their uh, parking lot lights that could potentially be a, a violation. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, that came up the other day day and I my department does actually not handle um the the lighting on there we do monitor lighting as it goes into the ocean and so the best thing you could do for that one would be to email me and I can pass it on to the Department of Public Works and get that question answered my email is zendo.kern at hawaiicounty.gov I'll go next. Um, I have an audience question here. What's happening with the HPM uh, factory built homes? Permits, inspections, will it ever proceed as a product that's viable for us? Uh, yeah, not a department that I actually uh, regulate and maintain. Uh, that's the building division. Uh, my understanding, though, in my conversations with uh, both uh, HPM as well as the building division is that they are uh, able to actually get the factory built housing going. That's my understanding. I think they're just working on getting some, some mass, um, but it's not something that I actually uh, regulate. So it's not a, my forefront. Um, Zendo, can you just give us an update on Ina Leo, please? Um, uh, I guess there's a, a lawsuit against the county. Um, I don't want to go into the, it's a long it's a long paragraph here, but give us an update if you can. Yeah, Inalea. Um, so Inalea is an interesting one. Uh, Inalea was originally bridge Inalea, bridge and Inalea, which is a three thousand acre par, uh, project, and then they split it out to Inalea and then bridge Inalea, which basically created fifteen hundred acres um, each, and they were entitled. And what happened was that they were challenged and because they did the EA or the environmental assessment on only the Inalea property um, and they were supposed to do a broader uh, look at it to see the cumulative impact that that essentially uh, went to court and then 
the judge remanded it back to the planning department and said, you know, you need to take a hard look at this and really see, um, does the EA need to go further? So we looked at it from a holistic large approach and said, yes, it does need to go, it does need to go further and take into effect um, the cumulative impact that there's a crossover to their project that needs to look at it. Now, there was a component of it, Lulana Gardens, which is kind of a standalone area, the affordable housing component of Inalea, which is about 430 um, some odd units. Those are the ones as you're driving down Waikoloa Road, you see out to the right there, the ones that have been built there and sitting there forever. Um, so when we came in, um, the, uh, the owner of Inalea and their representatives came in and talked with me and the mayor and said, well, what can we do and what can't we do? And we looked at it again with a fresh, fresh perspective and said, you know, your, your zoning right now is, is, is lapsed in certain areas. Your EA is invalid. If you want to do the big project, you really got to look at it holistically. But there are provisions that we can actually stand up the affordable housing side of it. We need housing. So in the department, we went through the agreement with them and got it. So the affordable housing side of it can be built. Those units could be finished out. 430 units could be completed. They have to put the infrastructure in. They're going to have to address the street light and all of that, you know, wastewater, water, et cetera. And that's where it is right now. And my understanding is that the owners are working on capitalizing the project. Once you go outside of that with the rest of the, the complexity of their financing and their structure, I have no, I have nothing to opine on that. But we did make it so those affordable units could be built as long as they can get their, um, their things together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, following up on affordable housing, you mentioned a couple of things, you know, opening up Ohana to, you know, to making some changes to all the being able to build Ohana's on property, adding sewer capacity, um, and, you know, now with, with Inalea, um, can you just touch on a little bit more on how some of those things, you know, the sewer capacity and other affordable housing plans that the county is actively working on or you know federal organizations that you may potentially be partnering with to bring in some funding for those kinds of projects sure yes thank you for the question uh, so infrastructure is obviously one of the keys we work very closely with the how with our housing office and susan Kuntz. um so it's it's it, right now it needs to be focused and so where is the infrastructure so for example waikoloa has private infrastructure, that's where we're seeing units being built. You get over to the Kailua area where there's desperate need for, for units, there's a lack of infrastructure, wastewater and water. And so we actually did a, we're working on a pilot program right now with the state, with that TOD council I had mentioned, they offered a pilot program and I chose the area between Hinalani and Palani to look at this area as a pilot area of what infrastructure needs to go in, how can we fund it, what are our various options for funding? And they brought in, uh, various consultants from infrastructure professionals to financing professionals, and we're working with them, and they're going to be giving us a roadmap on what they believe um, needs to happen for us to actually fund and get the infrastructure. But really, the fact is, is that we're trying to get as much grant money as we possibly can, work with the state, but it has to be focused. And that's the area that I see as far as the low hanging fruit as, you know, getting capacity to Kealakehe, getting water, but water in that area is extremely challenged because it's being challenged. And so I'm not sure if you folks had, uh, are familiar with the Oda Well conversation, but the Oda Well there are, there are 1,200 affordable units ready to rock and roll, um, ready to be built um, right in that area. There is a need from the Department of Water Supply and NELHA, and they did, NELHA did the application, went in with a joint application with the, uh, with the Stanford Cars Project for the Affordable Housing, uh, DWS, Department of Water Supply, and NELHA to get the well permit. And the Sea worm, the Commission on Water Resource Management, kind of changed their process. Instead of just like going through and approving wells, they decided to go through this whole commission process, which then they did approve it with onerous conditions that have basically never been met. It's like saying yes, but no. And so Nelha ended up doing a, a contested case hearing against themselves and trying to work that out. So every area that we look, we're being challenged with that, but the goal will be focused, focused, focused infrastructure in those areas. And then 
then build out like that. But what we need is we need the people, the landowners in those areas to be willing to do something. So trying to work, reach out and talk with the various landowners to say, hey, if we're working on putting infrastructure in here, will homes be built? And so that's part of it is getting the infrastructure in there and the general plan helps define where that's going to go and we're working on that which will then come down to the functional plan and mandate um, various departments to do these plans because really our, our plans on where this is going are so outdated it's, it's ridiculous um, and then with the code change the goals will be that again those smaller lot sizes that live work play get that maximize that infrastructure investment and that's that's the general concept. That's where we see the uh, the, the growth happening. Just want to acknowledge a couple of other people in the audience that asked questions. I'm not sure whether you can do anything about the roosters in our town. <laughs> uh, feral ones. <laughs> yeah, we have a growing number of chickens in our town, and and one person was asking. Um, what could be done about that since it's not an agriculturally zoned town? Yeah, see, when, once they get going, they get going. Now, if it's zoned residential, folks aren't allowed to have roosters in residential zoning if it's ag zoning. But once they go rogue, we do not have any control over the rogue rooster. Um, I will try to work on a solution for that, um, but don't have one right now. Just also want to acknowledge that he he did say he wants he's looking for volunteers for CDPs. Um, he talked about um, the um, uh, sea level rises, yeah, that he's working on with the climate action plan, and also um, he talked about how he's trying to work with the um, the billing department so that he can streamline when he gets the plans. He doesn't have to. Right. Come back. I'd like to see them, you know, put all their comments and reviews and all yeah. these things that are lacking, then send it back out to the developer. Yeah. Instead yeah. of I agree with you a million bazillion percent. There's no doubt. So one of the challenges that we have is it'll come in and they'll do the initial review on it. And then it has to come for land use, right? And it makes sense. Like, let's look at land use. Do you have your setbacks, your height and all those elements before you get into a structural review? Because if something's wrong land use wise, then the structure would have to change and you're kind of wasting time and money. So once it comes to us, again, we process it in the same day, three days on average. And, but what happens is sometimes we have a comment. You, know, you got to you know, make this adjustments, fix this. And then that goes back to the building division that goes back to the applicant. The applicant makes their, makes their adjustments and it goes back to the building division. Then I get the call. It's been sitting, my plan's been sitting at uh, planning for three months. I have a mini heart attack because that's not what I'm about. And I'm like, what are you talking, what? We don't do three months. And I go back and look at it and I say, oh crap, it's still sitting at the building division. And I'll have my team call them and say, hey, can you send that plan up? Because the, commu the, the communication there isn't uh, automatic within the system. As soon as they do, we're able to sign off on it. So my goal is, is with the building division is to say, as soon as it comes to us, we own that section of the plan. We can work with the applicant. They can make their adjustments. We can upload it back into the system. We can sign off and approve it. And when we're done, then it goes back to the building division and they can do their multi-agency review. Because my staff, for the most part, will, when there's an issue, they'd rather call the, the, the architect, the person and say, hey, we've got this little adjustment. Can we fix it right now? It's just much more efficient. And so if we can get that authority we will be more efficient and I'll no longer get blamed for a plan sitting at planning for way too long. Can, can, can you get a, like an outline made for the contractors or, or the architects as, as far as doing this, 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 this before you even submit the thing? That's what they're, I, that's what the building division is working on. I have very little influence uh, over there. Um, and that's what I'm hoping that they're doing is a streamlined, straightforward process with, uh, you know, one-time reviews. You know, I'm a fan of, of keeping things moving. I like to call what I call straight line permitting. It keeps moving forward. Even if you're getting comments, let's keep it moving forward. And, you know, you don't get your permit till the comments are addressed, but let's just get those addressed and come out versus it's like back and forth, back and forth. That back and forth doesn't work. 
Hey, thank you. So what current efforts are being made to define and promote agricultural use of agriculturally zoned lands as opposed to the creating of non-agricultural larger, larger estates? It's a good question. So ag, forcing people to do ag is quite challenging. Um, people can buy their buy the ag land. We have no control over that. So what we're trying to do again is this one is out of my jurisdiction, but part of it could be through a property tax concept of are you doing true ag? Are you doing ag that's going out for food consumption or are you raising three goats? From a planning department perspective, we look at it from a zoning and if they're doing a little bit of ag, they're doing a little bit of ag. We have no control over that, um, but if we can get things so it's more there's more incentive to do the ag or even for maybe a large landowner that um, uh, that owns their 40 acres and beautiful and they don't want to do a lot of ag but maybe they want to lease out part of it to farmers to come in and they get a good tax break so it's kind of like looking at where are the carrots and sticks for that i don't have the authority or jurisdiction over any uh, property taxes but that's one area that i could see that could move the needle a little bit any last questions, Nancy? Okay, yes, Patty, do you have a question? Yes, um, Zendo, you talked in the beginning about being short staffed. Yeah. What can we help with that? Find people that want to um, work in the in the department. There's two, you know, two issues. Is one at one point we had nobody signing up. Two, our HR process is kind of slow and onerous. So if we actually had more people that were interested, for example, like I need a clerk three in West Hawaii. And, you know, they, they do all of our processing and routing. And it's pretty, pretty intense that the clerk three, their take home pay is generally around $500 a week. Yeah. How do you make that work when you can't even get a, a, a rental for $2,000 a month? No. And oh, one last thing I want to say, we also were looking for a good um, planning commission um, candidate for North Kohala. If anybody has a, um, a name, send them my way. Thank you, Director. Really appreciate your time and kind of managing all those different topics there. Thank you for doing that. And great Mahalo. to have you join us this evening. Yeah, absolutely. Mahalo to you. Thank, thank you all very much. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, Quite frankly, I feel like I come up short every day, um, but I keep trying my best and trying to do, do the best I can to serve our community. But just really want to thank you all for your attention and uh, welcome to come back anytime. So, mahalo nui. Thank you, Director. Okay, well, we're going to kind of wrap up our meeting here and we'll close things up. So, thank you for your patience here. There we go. All right. Uh, last few words here. Mahalo nui to our presenters that join us here this evening for sharing their monot with the community, taking the time to update our viewers and our attendees and creating these opportunities to engage with the community at different levels. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers and our attendees here that joined us here this evening in person, our viewers online. Uh, we're, we're grateful for your support and your contributions. Mahalo nui to Tutu's house for allowing us to be here and hosting us this evening, open the space for our community meetings. Uh, you're always welcome to revisit and rewatch these recordings up on our YouTube channel. Facebook page. Um, for I did miss one uh, announcement earlier. If you are interested in infrastructure, the Traffic Safety Committee, the South Carolina Traffic Safety Committee will be meeting here uh, for the next couple of months in person. We're going to try a hybrid thing for that group as well. And then we'll be going down to White Kalo. So we're going to try that as well. And then, uh, yeah, I'll, I can connect to, yeah, I'll connect to the after. Thanks, Julia. Um, our next month's meeting, we're, we're joined, we're going to be joined and excited to be joined by navigators and community leaders from Nakalai Ba'a. So excited to have them here with us that night in March. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you this Saturday in the community for a lively weekend for a lively festival. That should be a lot of fun. And on behalf of the Waimea Community Association Board, I want to wish you good health, be well, aloha. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.